Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy. Our third series is focusing on this rather complex relationship. I'm going to take my glasses off uh, between democracy and citizenship. It's a tricky relationship. It's not as self-evident as some of us might like. Um, uh, the first interview in this series, a marvelous interview, I thought, not because of me, but because of the person I was interviewing, was uh, Adrian Clarkson, the former uh, Governor General of, of Canada. Uh, she has a book out, uh, a, a very successful book uh, on, uh, on citizenship. It's called Belonging, uh, the, the, the Paradoxes of Citizenship. And I think that citizenship does indeed come with paradoxes. We've, um, we've talked a lot about this so far in the series. The issue of belonging and inclusion, they don't naturally go together because of course, if you belong somewhere, you're also excluding others. And that accounts for the paradox of nationalism and citizenship, both in the 20th and 21st century. So how are we gonna, figure out a way around this paradox. Um, one of the problems, I think, with what we might call the Western Enlightenment project over the last 300 years, Edward Said pointed this out marvelously in his book, Orientalism, is the West has always thought that it has something to teach the rest of the world, particularly the Islamic world, uh, a world which had dominated the world or the known world up until the um, the, 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 the European military industrial complex seized control of the world economy in the 16th and 17th century. And uh, our, I mean, the Western relationship with, 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 with the Islamic world has been fraught and it continues to be fraught. And I think it's always assumed when it comes to politics and democracy and citizenship that we have something to teach the Muslim world. But perhaps the reverse is true. Perhaps the Muslim world, um, with its many centuries of a rich tapestry of history, is something to teach us, particularly when it comes to this paradox of inclusion um, and citizenship. One guy I know who is extremely interested and interesting to talk about this paradox of democracy and what uh, the Islamic world can teach us in the West um, is my guest today. Abdul Rahman Malik um, is a, a remarkable man. He wears many hats and he has a particularly colorful hat in our conversation today. He's a professor um, of divinity, uh, uh, of Islamic studies at the Yale School of Divinity. He's a very distinguished broadcaster, broadcasts a lot on the BBC and is involved in all sorts of interesting nonprofit initiatives around the world. Um, uh, he goes by AR, uh, so I'm going to call him AR in our conversation. AR, that was a really long, winding introduction. I apologize for keeping you silent for so long. Um, did it make any sense? Though? I think it made sense to me, Andrew, in a, in a number of different ways. And I think part of, part of the dilemma is, you know, when we talk about things like the West and the Islamic world, you know, I ask myself because I go to those shorthands too all the time. And then sometimes I got to stop myself and say, what do we actually mean by that? I was born in Toronto into an incredibly multicultural first Muslim community. Though in the days that I was born, there was a handful of mosques. So our mosques uh, our mosque that my parents uh, attended and took myself and my my sisters and, and brother to was a bit of the we are the world mosque. You know, there were uncles from Nigeria and aunties uh, from Guyana and grandmothers from, from Trinidad and folks from Somalia and Albania and Bosnia. And so my experience of community from a very young age, even though it was a Muslim community, it was a faith community, was an incredibly multicultural multinational, multi-ethnic, and multilinguistic community. Of course, Toronto, being one of the most diverse cities in the world now, in a way evolved to reflect what I had already experienced as a youngster. And if you would have asked me then, as, as a child, as where is the Islamic world, I would have said, oh, Toronto's part of the Islamic world, right? Mm. Um, our, our mosque on Bowstead Avenue um, in a residential neighborhood, former church, 
would have been part of the Islamic world. And I think that in a way, my generation, the generation of immigrants who came, the generation um, of those individuals who connect to the stories of, of, of migration and beyond, I think we often feel that, you know, we often feel that our place in the world has been problematized. We feel like, like, how do you actually belong? And you asked all these incredibly important questions right off the top, right? Because belonging seems to contain within it the seeds also of othering. And, and so you think to yourself, well, well, you know, I'm always struggling to belong. I'm trying to cl clarify that my Muslimness, my Punjabiness, my Pakistaniness, my brownness does not make, uh, does not disqualify me from being Canadian or being part of this thing that we that we call the West. But as I've grown up, I've actually, I've, I've, the narrative that I and those around me, friends, colleagues, beloved ones, have had, and, and, and what I tell my students now is that your being children or grandchildren of, pe grandchildren of people who migrated, uh, who moved from place to place, you have a superpower. And that superpower is the ability to have your two feet in four places at the same time is your ability to navigate through what others might consider fault lines for you it is natural. If you think back to like uh, Midnight's Children, uh, Salman Rushdie's mm. magnum opus, right? These children of midnight who were able to, in the magical realism of the world that he created, were able to navigate spaces which no one else could. The, the Salman Rushdie you bring up is the Salman Rushdie of Midnight's Children who was born at midnight or the, 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 the novel in which uh, his, his, his main character was born at midnight, looking both ways, Janus faced. But of course, Salman Rushdie is, is best known for uh, the impact of his other most famous book, uh, Satanic Verses, in which a fatwa was passed down and he had to live in hiding for several years and he's still mm. not entirely secure. There'll be people watching this they are, who say, oh, how, how can you imagine uh, Islam as a universal creed, one of inclusion, given uh, the, the satanic verses, given the modern history of the Middle East, mm. given ISIS, given what seems to be an increasing civil war between Shiite and Sunni Islam. What would be your response to that? It's, 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 it's the right question to ask, Andrew. If you, if you didn't ask it, I think something would be, would, be, would be remiss because we are confronted with those ideas. I think there's strong forces behind those ideas, and we can certainly talk about that. Let me, let me begin with Satanic Verses, because I think the Satanic Verses episode is actually a very interesting one, and it's a very formative one for me personally. And I think, you know, I was a young person when the book came out. I remember I tried reading that book as, a, as probably a 13 or 14-year-old and not really understanding the contours of it, but recognizing that that globalized generation that I was a part of, but also our parents who were struggling to belong, who are struggling to be part of this place, but also struggling to preserve um, their faith for their families as my, as my parents did, who were trying to, you know, who were trying to represent what they felt was, was truly what, what their faith and what their culture represented. For them, the appearance of the satanic verses and it's very audacious, bold, and, and, and certainly, you know, certainly provocative views on religion and religious history, because that's what Satanic Verse is about. It's about narrative and story, and, and, and someone really takes us powerfully and provocatively into what makes what makes sacred story. It 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 is for some it bristled. So for some it was just a sense of like this book causes offense and we need to go that step further. For those who were engaged in, in fatwa passing and, and, and fatwas are these non-binding, we have to remember religious rulings, right? And certainly because it came out from Iran, it took on a different form and, 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 and shape certainly. But even that fatwa was, you know, like when I look back on it, like 
it was it was it was based on so much conjecture. And you know, it was years later, Andrew, that I revisited the Satanic Verses. I remember it was a first year university, and I was having a crisis of faith. I was actually, you know, I was really deep into this kind of kind of real questioning, you know, about about my own my own faith and my own Islam. And I remember at that age being, you know, 18, eight, probably 18, 19 years old, asking myself, you know, have I ever stress tested this thing that I call faith? And, you know, one of the ways that I stress tested it was I actually read the entire oeuvre up until that point of Salman Rushdie's writings. You know, I started right at the beginning and I read Shame and I read Jaguar Smile and I read Midnight's Children and I got to Satanic Verses. And I had such an interesting experience with that book. And I think this is going to be relevant to the second part of your question, because I remember reading the Satanic Verses and finding myself very unoffended but I found myself challenged. And it made me think about the power of religious narrative. And at the heart of it, the Satanic Verses for me was a book about migration. It takes place in the inner cities of England that I, little did I know in a few years, I would be living there. I lived mm. in a white chapel in the heart of East London. I lived on the kinds of streets that the Satanic Verses, drive. I became part of those streets. Those were my, that was my hood. Or as you know, as we say back in the, back in the mother country, those were my ends. And I was proud of my ends. I was proud of the communities that I lived in, even with all their contradictions. And in a way, rereading Satanic Verses opened me up to that and actually opened me up to that reality. Because at the beginning of Satanic Verses, if you might recall this, Andrew, there's a, there's a, there's a statement from Daniel Defoe that the devil was, was cursed and that curse was the devil could not place his foot in the same place twice, right? There is the devil's curse of migration. Once moving, always moving. Once displaced, always displaced. You know, once out of home, always out of home. And I thought it made me think about my parents. It made me think about that generation. In another essay, Rushdie in imagined, uh, Imaginary Homelands, in, in, this, in this essay on, on migration, he talks about the Indias of the mind. The Indians that you dare not look back at because you'll turn into a pillar of salt, right? I, I, I started to recognize that in the, in the elders in, in our community, how they had this kind of relationship with the home country. Why is this important to me? It was important to me because it helped me contextualize the anger that people felt. It also helped me engage with my tradition in a renewed way. And I think as I did that, I became really conscious of an Islam that was civilizational. My work over the last 15, 17 years has, has focused on, on how can we as confessional Muslims organize ourselves to build resilience to ideologies and theologies of violent extremism. What are the tools, what are, um, What's happening in our communities? What are the institutions that is a bulwark against ideological violence in a world of ideological violence? And without ignoring the pernicious impact of American empire or Western hegemony or the colonial post-colonial reality, ignoring none of that, but also saying that is there a higher moral calling? Is there a way that we meet these, meet these challenges? And this is what I've found, Andrew. As I've traveled from Indonesia to Pakistan, to the Sudan, to Mali, work in South Africa, in Malaysia, in Singapore, across Europe, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in the United States, what I see is an incredible resilience towards ideological extremism. People have a lot of right to be angry. Go to Northern Pakistan and visit a village that has been attacked by drones. You know, you, you're, you're a journalist, you're a writer, you know those stories. Go to Iraq, we know those stories. Go to places that are under occupation, like the West Bank or Gaza, we know those stories. Look at the Rohingya, the Uyghur people in China. These are stories that are amplified by the media moments that we're in. I'm sure you know this, this book um, by the Lebanese journalist uh, Kim Khatas. Mm. Uh, her interpretation of this supposed Sunni Shiite civil war, quote unquote, in, in the Islamic world, which she believes is 
uh, a creation of this triangle between the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. In your travels, when it comes to citizenship in the Islamic world, does this Shia Sunni divide, is it real or is it the imaginary community perhaps of fundamentalists and government officers in Iran, in Washington, in Saudi Arabia? I think, it, I think there is no doubt that, it, that the Shia Sunni divide has been amplified for political reasons by this, this nexus of political operators. And I think we saw that writ large during the, during the um, in, in occupation and invasion uh, of, of Iraq. It's also, I think it is also the result of a kind of, I don't, I don't know how to put it, but the only way I can think of Andrew is a kind of a lack of confidence, right? Um, that, that emerges where the minority threatens a majority. My father grew up in a city called Multan, uh, which is in Southern Punjab, a historic and ancient city said to have been visited by Alexander the Great and actually the site of the tombs of great Sufi uh, saints and, 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 and religious figures. My father grew up in a neighborhood called Gulgasht where um, there was, it was probably a 60% Sunni, 40% Shi'i uh, population. My father's intellectual mentor was his uncle Shafi, who was Shia and, 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 and part of a Shia family who lived in the neighborhood. They were as close as father, father and son. My father will still get teary eyed when speaking about Uncle Shafi. It was Uncle Shafi who introduced him to, to, to Marx and, 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 and Hegel and, and, and contemporary philosophy. And, you know, when I asked my dad about how was it growing up in a mixed neighborhood, he said when, when Muharram, the, the Islamic New Year would come and the Shia community would mark the death of, of Imam Hussein, the prophet's grandson who died fighting uh, the tyrant of his, uh, of his time, he goes, we would participate in that, in that morning in our, own, in our own mosques and we would recognize that time. I think something very pernicious has happened. I think there has certainly been the petrodollar funded um, literalist Islam that has now been well documented by so many uh, people that has continued to drive a wedge between Shia and Sunni, but has also tried to create kind of a Puritan Islamic framework that, that actually seeks to deny cultural um, uh, um, diversity seems to, uh, seems to deny exegetical diversity, seems to de deny different schools of thoughts and experiences of Islam. And I think that has been a challenge. Let's talk about both the historical and contemporary models which um, Islam may offer for a 21st century world of, of post nations, uh, an inevitably unavoidably globalized world for those of us, like myself, fortunate enough to have visited Cordova and Istanbul, littered all around the world are these monuments of universalism from the, the golden age of, of Islam. What does the history of Islam teach us about the 21st century in terms of getting beyond the exclusion of the nation state? I think what's, what's interesting about that question is, and you talk about uh, Cordoba and, and you talk about Granada and we talk about Istanbul and the hey, and it's a multicultural cosmopolitan heyday, is that I think, I think once again, in the DNA of those places, in those urban spaces, is that people are gonna encounter and come into contact with each other. The prosaic encounter, Andrew, for me is as powerful as the intentional encounter, the living together, the working together, the trading together, the studying together, the convivencia that we so celebrate about uh, Andalusia, and to what, to some extent, which is which which is a, a, which is fictionalized, I think, mythologized in a way. Not to say the convivencia did not exist, but you know, no. Uh, no, no places without without deep flaws, and 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 so I don't want to paint this as, as a kind of a halcyon picture. I, I think I'm at that point in my life where halcyon pictures are are um, become cliches, right? I think what we're talking about is the messiness of how people live together, and I think what places like Andalusia offer us is a sense of what does convivencia mean? What does it mean to learn together, live together, to learn from each other, to cross-pollinate ideas and to create institutions in our societies 
uh, which, which, which do so. And I think part of that is something that I think was, was almost like it was, it was, a, it was a, an internal mechanism in Muslim societies. And it's been written about when people write about the Bengal or the island of Java in modern day Indonesia, they talk about this thing called syncretism, right? Which, you know, is that, is that term, term which refers to the way in which one tradition takes on the elements of another tradition and makes it its own. For me, I see that as something, as an active process. I'll give you an example. I go to the island of, of Java. I've worked in Indonesia a lot over the last sort of 12 or 13 years. And I'm always amazed, you know, Indonesia, I, I often joke with, with, with friends and colleagues is sort of the Alice in Wonderland of Islam. Everything, you know, there's things that look Islamic, Muslim, it all makes sense. And then all of a sudden you get in closer and it's like, oh, it's not the way I know it from the Middle East or from, or from South Asia, for instance. Javanese Islam, there is, there has been a way in which the Hindu stories, uh, which were which were on the island because the island was majority Hindu before uh, Muslim traders came and the Sufis in particular the mystics and there was this transfer spiritual transformation that took place um, in, in the islands of modern day Indonesia. There was all these stories like the Ramayana, like the Mahabharata, these great epics that we know from India, but of course that are part of the Hindu tradition. If you go to Java today, those epics are Javanese Muslim epics. They're performed as Java, they're part of the tradition of the Javanese tradition, which is an Islamic tradition. Children dance in them, people know them. It was interesting for me to speak to young people. I participated in a project talking about fault lines, Andrew. Um, a few years ago, which is continuing in Southeast Asia today, where we, in the aftermath of attacks on non-Muslim places of worship in five major towns in Java, we brought together young grassroots Muslim leaders and young grassroots Christian. This, this is Project Sarita. Is this the the, the, the Google right. uh, supported project that you did in India? Absolutely. It was funded by Google and Tides Foundation. It was called Charita, which means story in Bahasa Indonesia and the Indonesian language. And you know what we did? We brought these young people together. They didn't know each other. They were from the same communities, but very local, you know, from churches and mosques and street level organizations. And we got them telling stories together about what it could, what it means to be Indonesian together. We didn't hold back. We use drama and particularly my work um, in the theater of the oppressed to really embody what it meant to undergo and to see violence. But at the end of it, the stories that these young people were telling, right? The, the, the references that they were making to things like the Mahabharata, but also to their own traditions and finding the connective tissue was remarkable. It was a practical way in which story and recognizing one another's humanity and trying to see beyond the moment of crisis and, and deep empathy and compassion became operationalized. I, I, I can tell you, Andrew, that those young people, we trained 150 in five major cities have now gone on to train and reach over 2000 similar leaders who are using storytelling and drama in their communities. And How did it work in terms of boys and girls, AR? Because you know this much better than I do. Um, the, the question of women, in Islam is a, is a, is a very controversial one. Um, are the traditions that you're talking about of, in, of inclusivity, uh, inclusivity and belonging, um, do they get beyond the traditional gendered stereotypes of men oppressing women? Oh, most certainly. I mean, you know, our groups were, were actually more than 50% female. And men and women work together in places like, you know, in places like Indonesia, in, in places where I've worked, like in the Sudan, which I know in, in, you know, in modern times has been associated with the Islamist um, tendency and so on. You know, I have only witnessed women who are who are not only strong and powerful, that's almost secondary to just being part of, of public and social. But you life. wouldn't find this in Pakistan. You wouldn't find this. Um, in the Gulf, would you? You know, I think I think in places that you, you would. And I think that this is what is happening. And, and once again, not to sugarcoat, I'm really careful about that mm. because we gotta be really honest about what is happening in our societies and communities. There are those who are continuing to push against old norms who are pushing against patriarchy and frankly, who are pushing against misogyny and, uh, and sexism. 
I mean, I have, I have real deep uh, concerns about some of the governments of the Khalij of the Gulf and their politics in places like Yemen and elsewhere. I've also spent time in the Gulf where I have just been blown away by the incredible female leadership in the cultural sector, in the political sector. And the economic, actually. And the economic sector and in, in, in universities and institutions and in arts and culture and literature. I think all of those, you know, are important in terms of reshaping the, uh, what we think is going on. Also, Andrew, it is really important to know that things aren't static. You can't stay still on a moving train. There, the, I, I, for me, some of the most creative, challenging theological voices in, in, in the worlds of Islam right now are the voices of women, theologians, jurists, and others who are actively engaging tradition, who are actively engaging the past, who are arguing, debating, writing, positing. So you would reject the arguments of I, I don't know whether I would want to call her a scholar or a polemicist. Like uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if I'm going to get a name right. Aisha Ali, the yeah, um, yeah, Ayan Hirsi Ali. Is I, she I, I, just I, basically wrong? I know. Yes, I, I, and I reject. I, I don't reject the experience of violence and and marginalization in terms that, of her upbringing in uh, Somalia that people have faced. It, it is not my place, and 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 in fact, in fact, we know that that that, that those are violences that happen and not only need to be stood against by women, but, but entire societies. That having been said, I, I, I mean, I go back to my own experiences as well of strong women of the way in which I, you know, I was directed by my mother and others. I look at my, 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 my partner, my spouse, my sisters, the, the incredible people I, I, I work around me, the students, that I, that I teach here and elsewhere. And what I see is that the vanguard of grassroots leadership, the vanguard of civil society leadership, those who are gonna be elected to Congress like Ilan Homer and Rashida Tlaib and others are going to be American Muslim women and Canadian Muslim women. And that in fact, our communities and those, those commu there's elements of our communities that are, that, that you know, have been closed um, have, you know, are, are deeply problematic. Those are, those are being challenged. AR, let's end with some geography that ties us together. <laughs> um, at the end of the 19th century, my family uh, came from uh, Eastern, what now is Eastern Poland, um, Russia, Ukraine, I'm not quite sure where, the old pale of Eastern Europe mm. as Jews. They uh, came on ships and they arrived in East London. And uh, my family's origins in the old East End of London are still dear to my heart. A mm. hundred years later, you as a, a Canadian American scholar came to East London and, and you saw a remarkable cultural vitality, the same kind of vitality Absolutely. which uh, my great great grandparents might have created only today, 100 years or 150 years later, it's a vitality built around um, globalized Islamic communities. What is it about East London that's so magical? Oh, Andrew, we could talk about this for hours. I, I, there's so many things I want to say, but let me say this. My wife and I arrived in East, East London. My wife was born in, in the UK, grew up in Singapore. We met through our work as journalists like a good Muslim husband, I followed her to London and there we were three years later, ended up in the heart of Whitechapel. Our neighbor- Which is where was, my family came first too, yeah. And, and, and you know what? I mean, we walked the streets that your great grandparents the walked. The bagels, uh, did you go to Mussy Marks and the bagels? Uh, we, and we, 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 absolutely, it was one of our favorite places to go because it's over 24 hours. And so anytime you feel the need, you go, you go there. You know what's interesting to me is that I, I grew up in a building where there was still a lot of I, I moved rather to a building where there was still a lot of older Jewish people living, particularly women, um, and we got to become very close friends with them. And I think Farina, my 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 better half, and I were very intentional that when we moved into East London, it was so important for us to know the history of the neighborhood to connect to that. And so uh, my, my son was lucky enough for the first few years of his life to have a Jewish grandmother, Betty, who lived right next to us. And Betty's mom had lived 
literally in the same street as Betty lived in then. And while mm. our building had been constructed post-war because of the Blitz, she had lived in the neighborhood that that building was on. Betty remembered that. And she would tell us stories about, about the, the lay of the land, what Jubilee Street looked like and, and, and mm. what, what Whitechapel and Mile End looked like and where people went. And she had seen the community change. And for us to sit with her, to recognize not only her incredible Jewish heritage, where she came from, where the shul was and so on and so forth, opened our eyes that as we would walk the streets of East London, we'd see the Hebrew writing on the old buildings. We'd see the, the, the Jewish names. We knew where all the old synagogues were. My wife and I even went and found the old Jewish cemetery on the grounds of the Queen Mary University because we wanted to see and we wanted our son uh, to up see. Up the Mile End Road, right? Exactly, exactly. You know the place, Andrew. Um, we wanted wanted our son to see that that he was just the latest and behind him were the Bengalis and there were the Pakistanis and there were Jews and before the Jews came there were the Protestant uh, French the Huguenots who and the who Irish were, uh, and then the Irish in, in the middle there and there was tension but there was also this incredible sense of commerce and and people being together and and you know for me it's that it's like, what do we do in that togetherness? I, we have a we have a fundamental statement. Uh, you know, if I was, if you were to ask me, what is my what is what is my emblematic spiritual contribution to to the discussion on belonging? I'd give you this. Um, it is. It said that the Prophet Muhammad said that the merciful ones will be shown mercy by the merciful. Be merciful to those who are on earth and the one who is in the heavens will be merciful on you. That, that this idea that if there is an emblematic principle that I as a Muslim hold to, and my name reflects that, Abdurrahman means, means servant or, or slave of the merciful one, is that it is, it is mercy. And that our godliness, if we are confessional, uh, our our ethical value, our moral higher ground, to quote the Obamas, is dependent on our ability to show mercy. And mercy is that incredible thing, isn't it? It's it's empathy and compassion that encompasses faults. But it's also <laughs> vitality. I think one of the things I agree. you found in, in in East London is the the vital globalized world of young people, which could look inward and outward at the same time, rather like Rushdie's midnight child. It's it's absolutely true, uh, Andrew. And and you know that's not without its difficulties, and the politics of the moment often mitigate against that. And I think I saw that as as a journalist and as an activist and an organizer, as an educator who lived in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. I've seen the impact of politics and of political rhetoric and political narrative, and of Islamophobia and of growing anti-Semitism and of anti-Black racism and of incredible misogyny and of homophobia, we see these trends and we find them in our own communities. We find them in the world around us. What is, what is it that we are called to do? If we are called to fix democracy, then the fix of democracy at one level, of course, is systemic and institutional. But the fix of democracy is how do I live, quote unquote, democratically? And for me, compassion and tolerance and, and tolerance in, absolutely and, and there's and, and, an inclusiveness that goes beyond geography and, and andrew i mean i think i think i'm glad you said tolerance because because actually sometimes the starting the lowest common right denominator of this conversation is tolerance there's a reason why john locke called his letter a letter concerning toleration it's not that he liked the, the difference of, of opinions around him he said that the social contract must have toleration john gray has talked about that and i i I, I, I think to myself, yes, there is something that begins with that, that begins with the idea that we, we can vociferously disagree, but we must sit in community with that disagreement. Because one thing that I have to, I have to acknowledge is that the vast majority of my fellow citizens, of those who are around me, um, care for their families, care for their communities, want the common good, 
want equality of opportunity, want, uh, don't, uh, don't want to be uh, living in places where they're marginalized or exploited or they're oppressed. They want to see people who are homeless have homes. They want to see people who don't have opportunity have opportunity. And they want to see those who are resisting and fleeing violence to find safety. That's the nature of a good society. Abdul Rahman, uh, Malik, a wonderful, uh, a wonderfully uh, sprawling conversation like the old Islamic world full of color and vitality, like yourself. A real honor to talk, and I hope we'll continue this conversation in How to Fix Democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Andrew. It's been a pleasure to speaking to you.